Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's uh, review for Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 1, The Red Woman. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Season 6 of Game of Thrones, so I have to give a spoiler warning for Game of Thrones up to Season 6, Episode 1. If you haven't seen up to this point, you may not want to watch this video, otherwise some things may be spoiled for you. However, this video will not contain other kinds of spoilers, such as from the books or or production links. This video will be free of those kinds of spoilers. So, wow, I don't really know what to make of this episode. Um, I'm of course absolutely ecstatic that Game of Thrones is once again airing. I can't tell you how much joy it brings to me to be actually watching new episodes of Game of Thrones. And parts of this episode excited me to no end, while others I was not so happy with. Uh, so much like the episode did, let me start at the wall where we get the follow up to Jon Snow's murder as Ghost is howling and it alerts Davos to his death. So he and a group of Jon Snow's closest supporters, including Dolorous Ed, gather Jon Snow's body and hold it in a room, uh, refusing to go along with... Um, what has happened. Meanwhile, we see Alistair Thorne exert his control uh, over the Night's Watch. Some people are really upset over the fact that they killed the Lord Commander, but Alistair, uh, you know, manages to win them over. Uh, we also see Melisandre lament over Jon Snow's body, and she talks about how uh, she saw a vision of him fighting at Winterfell in the flames. Then Davos suggests that they could ask for help, as they aren't the only ones who owe their lives to Jon Snow. Obviously referring to the Wildlings, so it seems... Ed has gone on a mission to retrieve the wildlings for help. While well, Alisha gives um, the Jon Snow supporters an ultimatum and gives them until sundown to give up peacefully uh, and he'll let, just let them go, but Davos is convinced that he's lying and he would simply just kill them all after they give up. So... They said that they're dependent on Dollar's Ed, but Davos offers up that the Red Woman could also help them. And then we get the scene where Melisandre is alone, she strips naked, and uh, then she takes off her necklace and suddenly she appears as an extremely old woman and she climbs into bed. Uh, so what's going on here? It's been speculated that this is Melisandre's true appearance and that she uses magic through the redstone on her necklace to mask her appearance as a beautiful woman. Now, it's been pointed out that there have been several uh, scenes with Melisandre naked before without her necklace, and she looks the same as she always does. And I double-checked, and this is indeed the case, as in the fourth season, uh, when uh, Celise talked to Melisandre while uh, Melisandre was bathing, she was naked and clearly wasn't wearing the necklace. So I hope that's not what they're trying to imply, that without the necklace, she's an old woman, because... Um, she doesn't turn into an old woman. Uh, she does turn into an old woman as soon as she takes the necklace off. Uh, but if that's what they're trying to imply, it would be completely inconsistent with what has already been established in the show. It could mean uh, she used the necklace to drop the spell before taking it off because it did glow red as she took it off. And she can keep up the image even without the necklace on. However, it could be the case that this isn't her true appearance. Rather, she's casting some sort of spell that turns her uh, into an old woman uh, because it uses up all her life force. Or maybe she's just super old but hasn't aged because of magic and she used her magic to affect something else and that's given up all of her life force. Uh, if that's the case, they could mean that she's going to die, that she's given up her life to cast a spell. What spell, you may ask? Well, can we say resurrection? <laughs> she did say earlier she saw a vision of John fighting at Winterfell. However, I don't want to get too much into that in this video. Uh, but just reasoning from what we saw in this one episode, that's where my money lies. That rather than her young, beautiful appearance being a facade, she actually used magic to prevent herself from aging. And she's given up that magic, her life force, if you will, for Jon Snow. 
but we shall see. It is curious to see uh, where they'll go from here with Davos and the other Jon Snow supporters being held up, uh, but I put good money on them getting out alive. In fact, um, I'm changing my prediction based on this episode that I think Alicia Thorne and the other mutineers, including uh, much to everyone's joy, Ollie, are going to die, and that the Wildlings are going to come and help the Jon Snow supporters regain control of the Night's Watch, and Dolores Ed will become the new Lord Commander, and all the other brothers will fall in line once Alistair and the others are dead. Ah, but we'll see how that goes. So next, let's go to Winterfell, where Ramsay is uh, mourning Miranda's death, uh, no doubt planning a lot of horrible things to do to Theon. It's interesting we meet uh, the Bolton's maester, although I think he's a minor character who will barely appear in the show after this, but we'll see. Uh, then we see Ruse uh, complimenting Ramsay on the uh, defeating Stannis, and he calls it a great victory, but then he goes on to say it means absolutely shite if Sansa Stark escapes. Uh, but Ramsay assures him that he has his best hunting parties with hounds and they will find her and bring her back and Ruse kind of threatens Ramsay saying if they don't get Sansa back hopefully his wife is pregnant with a son. The threat quite plain to Ramsay that his position as Ruse's heir is in peril. It makes me feel very good about my prediction I made this season regarding Ruse and Ramsay. So we see Sansa and Theon struggling to get away. They even wade through a freezing cold river, which would no doubt give them hypothermia uh, if gone unchecked. And Theon's uh, redemptive arc is complete as he is very selfish, selfless and sacrifices himself and strives to save Sansa's life, even volunteering to surrender to the Bolton search party that catches up with them in an attempt to lead them away from Sansa. Unfortunately, it doesn't work and they catch up with her and Theon, but luckily Brienne and Podrick come storming in to save the day. Now, this is something I felt was quite easy to predict, but it does seem a tad convenient that uh, Brienne comes swooping in to save the day at the last minute, but overall, I'm good with it, and, and you know, I can just go with it. It does make sense that Brienne would know of Sansa's escape uh, from all the search parties looking for her, and she could have tracked the search party, and was that's how she caught up with them uh, just in the matter of time, but then again, how did she pick the right search party? Either way, I thought this was the scene was awesome, and this is what I was waiting for all season five to see Brienne finally swoop in and save Sansa. Granted, this may have been a bit more satisfying had we actually seen this in season five, but whatever. It was still an amazing fight scene, and one where I was just wanted to jump up and cheer. It was also great seeing Padre kick ass as well, although I did buy it, because they didn't go overboard with him being like a great warrior. He just barely managed to kill this one guy, and then he got defeated by another guy, and would have died had Theon not come along and saved his life. Which again, was really awesome to see Theon stick up for Sansa. And then Brienne once again pledges herself to Sansa, and of course this time Sansa accepts. She seems totally sincere in her acceptance of uh, Brienne's service, but uh, she's hardly in a position to turn her down right now, trapped in the snow, freezing to death after Brienne just saved her life. So we'll see how she feels about Brienne later on, but I'd imagine she retained an amount of gratefulness and trust in Brienne for what she just did, but it'll be interesting to see to what extent. I simply can't wait to see uh, what their next interactions are going to be. We must assume they're going to head to Castle Black because as far as they know, John is still the Lord Commander and that's where Theon told her to go when he thought that they would get separated so it makes sense that that's where they would head next. And again, I simply cannot wait to see what happens with them. I'm so pumped for this storyline. So, next we get a King's Landing, which is kind of, you know, the slow point of the episode that otherwise was pretty action-packed. And I want to make it clear, I didn't hate these scenes, as I did think they were absolutely necessary, but overall, they were just 
kind of slow. But it was interesting to see that Cersei didn't blame Jaime for Marcella's death because I totally bought that she would and uh, that it would create a rift between them. Uh, but their bond seems more strong than ever, as indeed Cersei didn't blame Jaime and instead thought it was inevitable because of the prophecy of Maggie the Frog. Uh, so it was really interesting to finally get that mentioned in present times. Uh, so we'll see how Cersei is affected by this new news. Uh, then we finally catch up on Marjorie to see how she's doing in incarceration as they continue to try to get Marjorie to confess, but she still refuses to confess, which kind of surprises me because Cersei already realized that that was her way out, but Marjorie hasn't yet. But I have a feeling that she will soon, and her conversation with the High Sparrow was an indication of that. Okay. <sighs> okay, okay. So now... We come to the part of the episode that really pissed me off. And of course, it's what is always subpar. It's Dorn. And all I have to say is fuck this shit. So Duran and Ilaria lament over, you know, how great of a man Oberyn was. But he wasn't a leader like Duran is. And then Duran gets a note telling him Marcella has died. And of course, he's pissed off. But before he can react, Ilaria and Tyene are quick to act as the uh, Tyene kills Ar Arya Hota and Ilaria Ar uh, kills uh, Duran. <sighs> so, I cannot even begin to express how much bullshit this is. So... The guards just stand around and do nothing, so obviously they're in on it with Ilaria and the, and the attempt to over, overthrow the leadership. And then the other two sand snakes go to Tristane and kill him as well in a scene that seemed really juvenile as Obara stabs him in the back while Nim uh, distracts him. Uh, this is fucking stupid. So three characters, Duran, Hota, and Tristane, are just dead, just like that. And what a fucking waste. I was saying that, you know, along in my prediction videos that my hope for Dorn in Season 6 is that its Season 6 storyline would justify the Season 5 storyline and make it better. But so far, it's making it even worse. As my main issue with it is that they had all these interesting characters like Duran, Hota, that we hardly see, and... Um, so I thought they could redeem the storyline by showing off how badass they really are. But instead, they just killed them off in the first fucking episode. What the fuck is this? It's total bullshit. So now I guess Alaria will become the ruler of Dorne and along with the Sand Snakes will seek to start a war with the Lannisters. Really? So that's the route they're going to go with Dorne? What a fucking waste. I will admit I do have like some sense of morbid curiosity to see where they take this storyline next, but I have no delusion that will be any good. Fuck Dorn. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> so then we cut over to Marine to see Varus and Tyrion touring the city. I must say I was a bit disappointed that we didn't get any Grey Worm or Masande in this episode, but it's always great to see some Tyrion and Varus interactions. It was kind of funny when the poor woman uh, thought that <laughs> Tyrion wanted to eat her baby uh, and he just wanted to feed them. Uh, so they basically explored Tormoral in uh, Marine and how it's basically a powder keg ready to go off as there's graffiti that says Misa is a master, and there's a red priest who's preaching to a street cow that they need to just stick up for themselves and take over and fight now that their Daenerys is gone. So again, powder cake. Uh, we do, however, get the first mention ever in the show that the Harpies... Uh, might have a leader behind them and Varys is endeavoring to find out who it is. But then suddenly Tyrion and uh, Varys find the Marinese fleet has been set on fire in which they assume is the work of the Sons of the Harpy and Tyrion proclaims that they won't be returning to Westeros anytime soon. Uh, this also really bothered me because they made a point of introducing a fleet of ships in Season 4 that didn't exist in the book and now they just promptly destroy that fleet. So what was the fucking point in introducing the fleet in the first place? It seems to me that the writers simply changed their minds and were like, you know, actually, I don't really want this fleet around anymore. Let's just destroy it. So it just seems like a convenient plot device and it just seems really contrived and I don't really buy it. 
So, then we see Dario and Jora on the mission to find Daenerys, and they come across her ring taken uh, from a site where clearly a Dothraki horde was, so they deduce the Dothraki have her. I don't really have much to say about this scene, as it went down pretty much exactly as one would su suspect. And I'm not a huge fan of the whole Jorah and Dario, you know, fighting it over who loves Danny best. I'm kind of over it. So next we actually get to see Daenerys being whipped and, you know, corralled by the Dothraki who talk shit about her and they're wanting to use her as a bed slave, not aware that she can understand every word that they're saying. Eventually she's brought to uh, the Cal, Cal Moro, who says he will lie with her tonight, but then she goes on a tirade in Dothraki and rattles off, you know, their million titles, just like I knew she would because she always does that on the Mother of Dragons. Queen of Marine, blah, 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 blah. But the cow honestly didn't give a shit and just laughed at her. Uh, that is until she revealed that she was married to Cal Drogo, which of course changes everything. And they assure her that she will be treated well and everything is great now. So she's like, oh, okay, just take me back to Marine and we can just forget the whole thing ever happened. But they're like, uh, no. Widows of fallen cows are to be taken back to Val's Dothrak to live out the rest of their days with the Dosh Kaleen. Uh, which of course isn't what she really wants and you know so she's not all that happy still now I try not to talk too much about my predictions in this video, but when I said in my prediction video that they would try to make her a bed slave and, you know, threaten her and all this stuff, a lot of people argue with me, um, but they treated her exactly as I thought they would. Well, at least until they found out she was married to Cal Drogo, and then they wanted to take her to join the Dash Kaleen. I didn't actually predict that would happen, but I was dead right about how they treated her before they knew. And I knew, I just knew that she would rattle off all these titles and they would laugh at her. I thought that was great. So finally we come to Bravos where we get a quick scene where Arya is a blind beggar on the streets and the wave comes by and beats the shit out of her not caring that she's blind. Uh, so not much to say about this scene as it's uh, merely just establishing what is to come as this is obviously just the beginning of her training of dealing with her new life of being blind. So, my rating for The Red Woman out of 10 is an 8, extremely good. I found this episode a mixed bag, which was mostly good, as I loved the tension between the Night's Watch and Jon Snow supporters, and the intrigue that was brought up with Melisandre and Brienne kicking ass and saving Sansa's life was awesome, and it was also great seeing the Khaleesi deal with the Dothraki, uh, but the King's Landing and the Dario scenes were just kind of there and the marine stuff irritated me a little bit and it seemed the writing seemed kind of clunky and the door stuff was awful absolutely awful and continues to be the bane of this show that brings the whole thing down and i don't have much hope for it going forward but overall i'd say i think positively of this episode and i think it was a good beginning to season six and i hope it only gets better from here so that's it for my review of The Red Woman. Be sure to check out my live discussion with Apkin Tomko tomorrow as we go into more detail on this episode and go all out on spoilers, including those from the books and production leaks. Uh, and we just discuss, and this discussion will be on my channel Monday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. time zone. And for me, it will be Tuesday at 2 in the afternoon here in New Zealand. But I'll put a link in uh, the description below to the event. So if you're unsure about the time zone, you can just click on the link and it'll tell you what time is going to be in your native time zone. So please join us live and for in the chat to ask any questions you may have about this episode so be sure to join us for that and be sure to subscribe to enchantment of eternity as i continue to cover season six of game of thrones and thanks a lot for watching